All right. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier this week on uh, the video that went up on, uh, I think it was Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it was, um, I want to do a longer video here. And so I'd say, instead of putting it up right away, I'm going to intro it a little bit, just real quick here. I'm going to try to only take a minute for this. But um, last one did re really well. I'm sitting here on uh, Saturday morning, and uh, it's doing pretty good, especially because I haven't really done a lot of videos recently. So the fact that I've gotten uh, 70 views on a video – and it's been like five, six months since I've done an actual video is really good. That's I'm really happy about that. So um, let me go ahead. Uh, I'm going to pull it up. We're going to do more. I'm going to do more reaction videos. I, I, this channel, I guess, is getting me views. So shout out to Extinct Zoo. I will, again, put the video link in the description and the channel in the description, um, just like I did for the last video here. Uh, we're going to do other reaction videos too, but um, I definitely really want to do this one just because they're – um this one seems really interesting and it's a bit of a longer video so i'm going to again try to cut myself off right here from an intro we're going to go ahead and uh switch layouts and uh yeah here we go let's say for one second that a mad scientist has created a time machine and is forcing you to pick a random period to travel to during the mesozoic a lot of your possible options would definitely lead to an unfortunate ending but whatever you do you really 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 should not pick 150 million years ago as this was an age okay. where instant death was around nearly every corner. Dinosaurs, per usual for the Mesozoic, ruled on land at the time. But even for dinosaur standards, the ones that existed back then were especially terrifying, with certain paleontologists considering this time period to be a golden age for supersized sauropods and meat-loving theropods. Unfortunately, even if you could snap your fingers and make the dinosaurs go away, 150 million years ago would still be a lot of nope with the land, so oceans, and skies harboring a lot of secrets that, that were, let's just say, unfriendly to life. Welcome to the late Jurassic. During this time, not even a map would do you much good, as Earth's land masses were fairly unrecognizable compared to current versions, with North America arguably being the most like its current self, having at least maintained hmm. a similar shape. Familiarity ends here, though, as to the south lays a giant mass of merged continents that form together what some consider to have been the last supercontinent, Gondwana. This ancient landmass was composed of South America, the Arabian Peninsula, India, Antarctica, and Australia, creating oh, no, the largest whoa, whoa, continent. Where did... So I guess Africa must have left before that. Okay. Because <laughs> obviously, like, you can see right here, like, on a map, like, they fit together. So I guess Africa must have left and before... Of Jurassic which uh -huh. covered almost well, one-sixth of the there, Earth's though. entire surface. I don't and know. from space, would have looked like a mega blob of land. Whoa. Surprisingly, not even Gondwana was the most foreign-looking continent at the time, Did with that not... title going to Laurasia, a giant Did continent within its own Africa? right that was made up of present-day Europe, Greenland, and parts of Asia. Okay, I don't know. It's it, unlike the... the rest of the Earth, was absolutely <laughs> covered pictures. by expansive waters that split <laughs> and isolated much of the land resulting in the countries we know of today being smaller and composed of numerous islands. Europe in particular was an island paradise that bore nearly no resemblance to the present. Its location was quite different too, being closer to North America than it is today. Meanwhile, China was right next to Iran and Turkey, yet extremely far away from India. Evidently, the geography was rather confusing, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Thankfully, however, late Jurassic oceanography wasn't. Since only two major bodies well, of water like existed, the, the Pacific of the world. <laughs> Ocean and the Tethys Ocean. Okay, the so Tethys we got two oceans. was already an ancient ocean at the time, having existed for over 100 million years. It <laughs> covered the Eastern Hemisphere and had recently experienced significant tectonic activity, which had raised it up, resulting in the higher sea levels that submerged large parts of Laurasia. Despite it getting this tectonic boost, it was still smaller than the younger, yet still 50 million year old, Pacific Ocean which now dominated just just think about that like we have the pacific ocean today this is around 150 million years ago and, and i guess it formed 200 million years ago just just think about that the entire western hemisphere and would continue to expand as time passed the late we jurassic also now. saw the emergence <laughs> of yet another body of water we all know of the atlantic ocean yep. although at the time it resembled a sea more than anything else being nearly entirely surrounded by land the Atlantic's temperatures were also unlike they are today, being remarkably warmer. And this was actually oh, yeah. a trend seen worldwide, with seawater averaging 32.1 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, making it 25% hotter than the current average. 
even in the deepest parts of the Pacific, temperatures were still considerably warmer, hovering around 17 degrees Celsius or 63 degrees Fahrenheit, akin to tap water. Wow. This heightened temperature wow. is often attributed to the increased tectonic activity of the time, which would have led to very active volcanoes, thus spewing massive amounts of CO2 into the water. Currently, paleontologists are actually aware of a few of these now extinct volcanoes, one of which is Earth's largest known volcano, Tamu Masif. This absolute unit is located 1,600 kilometers or 990 miles east of Japan and covers more seafloor than the state of California, while standing almost twice as tall as Mount St. Helens. During its active life, Tamu Masif would have made the oceans more acidic and heated up the atmosphere, leading to warmer conditions on land as well. In fact, 150 million years ago was most likely just about the warmest period in the entire Jurassic with an average daily temperature of 20 degrees. Look at this. So about 250 million years ago, that was really warm. Like four, what? Or sorry, like 375, like 425, and then they have 500 million. Hey, this is what? Probably like when the Earth was still forming. So, yeah. Yeah, it's even hotter. Like this, yeah. Where is... I guess the, is the asteroid is this, I guess? Yeah, no, I guess it, it has to be this, right? I guess that's where the asteroid has to be. Degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly 15% warmer than today. With this heat, Earth was experiencing climactic conditions that it hadn't for nearly 50 million years, with both the northern and southern hemisphere witnessing significant amounts of dry biomes, including deserts and savannas, which could be quite harsh on animals, considering that most also had distinct dry seasons, where severe droughts were not unheard of. Towards the equator, things got a little less cutthroat, as drier ecosystems gave way to lush expanse of tropical forests that covered the vast majority of North Africa. However, the most toned down conditions were not found there either, rather near and within the polar regions, since back then they were not brutally cold tundras, but rather temperate biomes similar to modern day Central Europe. The polar regions were so much warmer back then that they didn't even have ice sheets or glaciers. And as a result, life was absolutely plentiful. And, and even in the harsher right. climates closer to the equator, life still Under found a way, with the richest known formations actually hailing from these brutal areas. Dinosaurs in particular thrived and were enjoying a level of diversification never yet seen. Of all the groups lumbering around, theropods, sauropods, neornithischians, and armored dinosaurs were the most established, with multiple species from each group often being found within a single ecosystem resulting in a chaoticness rarely seen during the Mesozoic. This is perhaps best demonstrated by the Morrison Formation, which was an expansive North American biosphere that spanned across 13 states and was composed of arid savannas, forests, Foremost. and troubland. So far, over 40 dinosaurs are known to have resided there, including at least 10 different theropods, nearly all of which were big enough to hunt human-sized animals. Yet, unlike the Cretaceous, the Morrison's most dominant carnivores were not Tyrannosaurus, <laughs> who had yet to evolve, rather Allosauridae. The most abundant of them all was the Allosaurus, typically dubbed the Lion of the Jurassic thanks to its striking appearance. But it was a nearly unstoppable predator who sported razor-sharp teeth and a blood-inducing slashing bite that allowed it to hunt a wide range of herbivores. Studies have suggested that it may have even hunted in packs as well. But whatever the case, it undeniably dominated the lands accounting for 75% of all carnivore remains. Wow. With such numbers, you'd expect it to be a small yet plentiful creature. But no, Allosaurus was a giant by current standards, with adults weighing an average of 1.7 tons and measuring 8.5 meters or 28 feet in length. This comfortably made it one of, of the them. biggest predators around, but remarkably, even it wasn't the biggest terrestrial predator on Earth, with that title going to the Saurophaganax which happened to live in North America as well. That, this, this guy, I, I got to do a video on him. I, I don't know much about it. I've heard like a little, like obviously I know the name of him, but uh, as I stated in my uh, previous video that I've kind of like fallen off and like fallen out of like learning about other stuff. So I definitely, I want to do a video on him, whether it's, you know, if it's Extinct Zoo has a video or someone else has a video, but um, like it's kind of a newer, I, I guess it's, the right way to phrase it like a newer discovery um but it looks like 
it looks like a beast. So I, I am definitely wanting to do a video on this guy eventually. This, like the Allosaurus, was a member of the Allosauridae family and could weigh up to five tons, equivalent to nearly four adult giraffes. In addition <laughs> to classification, it was similar to the Allosaurus in many ways, both possessing robust arms, sharp claws, serrated teeth, and distinct crests, but yet differed in the shape of its vertebrae and obviously body size. Yeah. Alongside these two, there were still more carnivores who called the Morrison Formation home, with the most well-known right. ones including the Ceratosaurus, Torvosaurus, and the mysterious Edmarca Rex. Both of the latter were megalosaurus, and were also again gigantic, being more comparable to the Sarophaganax than other carnivores, with large specimens of Torvosaurus weighing around 4 tons, while the Edmarca Rex could have weighed just as much as the Sarophaganax. On the other hand, Ceratosaurus, while ferocious, was a large step down from the giant carnivores mentioned with large adults being similar in weight to polar bears. Love the so obviously still not small by obviously any not top predator, but Regardless, many still consider it to be the underdog of the Jurassic, yeah. overlooking its agility yeah. and deadly bite that made it a highly successful predator. Just and most like also forget that giant it, size know. was the exception, not the rule, uh, just cool since most people. Morrison predators were medium-sized, like the Ceratosaurus, or even smaller. For example, Troodontids and early primitive relatives of Tyrannosaurids made up the bulk of these smaller carnivores, who seldomly stood above a human's waist in stature. This may make you wonder how such small carnivores stood a chance in an ecosystem ruled by behemoths. And the answer is simple, niching. Instead of contesting and competing with each other, predators would just occupy different ecological niches, which is exemplified by Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus, with the former being found near bodies of water, whereas the Allosaurus preferred open terrestrial spaces. This helped keep the peace in a theropod-rich environment. But peace was not always possible, as North America and much of the Earth were subjected to severe droughts that drove nearly all to violence. With fossilized remains indicating extreme amounts of cannibalism, theropod-on-theropod -theropod violence, and scavenging. It was during these moments that being smaller was an advantage, because it meant much less calories were needed to survive. Mm -hmm. And this of course applied to small herbivores as well, which were mainly made up of Neornithischians. <laughs> more than five kinds are known from 150 <laughs> million years ago, world? but a couple of the more common <laughs> ones would have been the cougar-sized Dryosaurus and the larger Camptosaurus that weighed about half a ton. Despite their size differences, both had similar diets composed of ground-level plants, and the two also tragically shared a lack of defenses with speed being their only real plan A, plan B, and plan C, for that matter. This problem, however, was not at all common for other herbivores, as many became ruthless themselves in order to ward off theropods, like the iconic Stegosaurus, who happened to also be the largest non-sauropod you could find, with exceptional adults reaching 9 meters or 30 feet in length and weighing 5.5 tons. Not to mention, it also had a thagomizer, which while may sound funny, would have felt terrible for potential predators, as this was the large bony spikes attached to the end of its tail, turning it into a potent weapon individuals could use to pierce the bone of attacking carnivores, as evidenced in fossils by one unlucky Allosaurus. Oh, and Stegosaurus wasn't the only that. herbivore with a good- Oh, oh. oh. oh he had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> he probably had a bad life. <laughs> Theropod had turned in these lands. As fresh on the scene was my Murapelta, one of the oldest known ankylosaurs. It was considerably smaller than its later relatives, with adults only weighing 562 kilograms or 1,239 pounds. Yet, it did have the trademarked heavy armor that made ankylosaurs famous, with osteoderms spreading across the entirety of its upper body. These osteoderms varied in size and sometimes had sharpened edges, particularly when located near vulnerable spots. Sadly though, armor was no thagomizer, and numerous remains of this ankylosaur were found with signs of predation by theropods. Wow. Such a fate presumably extended to other existing armored dinosaurs as well, which included another ankylosaur, the Gargoylosaurus, and the stegosaurid, Alcovasaurus. At what this point, at you may be tired of hearing about so many dinosaurs, but to oh. really drive home the fact that this was one of their golden ages, you cannot forget about the most abundant dinosaurs of them all, gods sauropods. Of the time. Like, <laughs> In fact, 150 million years ago may have been the apex period I, for this it, it group, just, 
as they were typically the most before. common Imagine dinosaurs about, with Camarasaurus holding the title of the most abundant animal in the Western Hemisphere. Wow. But it was by no most means abundant. alone, and a mix of different sauropod families ran rampant, with the two key players being the Diplodocids and the Macronarians. Both of these families were powerhouses with multiple iconic members, some of them including household names like Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Supersaurus, Barosaurus, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, and the honorable mention Marapunosaurus, which belonged to neither family but was absolutely <laughs> massive. And in reality, every sauropod alive then, including They're those so cool. unmentioned, were pretty massive. Those tails are with whipped. the smallest weighing 13 tons, while the largest sat around 70 tons. If if you don't know much about the sauropods, they like an adult like had nothing to fear, like nothing at all. And, and obviously, like there there were smaller predators compared to the, you know Cretaceous, where you had like T Rex um, and stuff like that. But um, like those those tails, anything you know, they could just Whoa! They could they could step on you, they put 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 their front paws on you, and you're going in the ground. You got indents in your body. Your your ribs are crushed. I mean, they're they're. I I love the sauropods so much. It's just like and every it feels like every few years they like find a new um species of them. Uh, and it's just like yeah, like, it's just really cool. Like you got some that are kind of there's no picture here, but some kind of are a little more spikier and uh, a little more like armored on top. Of, like, like seen stuff for like that. Um, but like my favorite are the ones with, like, you know, like the platicus that just, whoosh, and they just whip and just <laughs> naturally with such <laughs> crazy fauna, many have been amazed by the Morrison since. Yeah. Kind of like, like more like spiky. Yeah, like, incredibly. You know, like that. The Morrison wasn't exactly special as much of the world had similar ecosystems where the same groups of dinosaurs dominated. And in some yeah. places, even the exact same dinosaurs could be found. For instance, if you try to escape the Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, or Torvosaurus by fleeing to Europe, you'd still run into them. While on the flip side, you could also <laughs> experience some absolutely great sauropod sightseeing in Gondwana, where evidence of Brachiosaurus, Barosaurus, and Camarasaurus were found. And even dinosaurs unique to other land masses still tended to follow the same trends seen in the Morrison, with many having counterparts across the globe. For example, Tanzania had the titanic giraffe and titan, which played a similar ecological role as Brachiosaurus. Additionally, Tanzania also saw the likes of Kentosaurus, the stegosaurian really counterpart cool. that, that's, uh, and close Zoot relative Taikun. of that's Stegosaurus. Where I know that one from. In Europe, the exact situation is again seen, with sauropods like the Oceano Titan and stegosaurs like the Centaurus peppering the land. Where Gondwana and Europe differed, been? however, was that they had a new kind of theropod family not yet seen in North America or anywhere else for that matter. And that is the Carcharodontosauridae, which were partially characterized by high yeah. neural spines, what, late, proportionally late long right? arms, and long narrow yeah, skulls. The oldest and first of them to evolve was the Vetoruprestosaurus, which resided in Tanzania <laughs> and weighed up to 1.65 tons and likely hunted a mix of stegosaurs and juvenile sauropods. Strangely, in China, which wasn't far away from Europe, Carcharodontosauridae weren't found, although they had their very own unique apex predator, the Yangchuanosaurus. Following the trend, this was a monster theropod that was nearly as long as the largest Torvosaurus and weighed up to 3.4 tons, making it the largest predator in all of Asia. From a distance, Ow. you may mistake it for a unit of an Allosaurus since the two were closely related and shared many similar features, but they were not cut from the same cloth. As Yangchuanosaurus was not an Allosauridae member, rather a Metriacanthosaurid, which in Greek means moderately spined lizards. So it's not surprising that this group's defining trait was, well, moderately sized spines. Beyond the uniqueness of Yangchuanosaurus, Asia was again much like the rest of the world with the four main groups reigning supreme and bearing multiple species. Some of the most well-known that lived at the time included Mementosaurus, Yingshanosaurus, Donosaurus, and Leishanosaurus. And it wasn't just the dinosaurs that would have made your eyes well, widen, as the late Jurassic accommodated a wide range of non-dinosaurs too, with the most dominant being crocodiliforms. Like dinosaurs, they came in a variety of sizes oh, yeah. and inhabited a diverse range of habitats. <laughs> Crocodiles used to be able to run. <laughs> if you don't know about that, 
Oh my god. But we're usually on Imagine a smaller a side comparatively. Like, like they can Most, kind of like run the gear size Amphicotylus, or but imagine one that could run hunting down fish, amphibians, and turtles that dwelled near them. But a few were actually fully <laughs> terrestrial and could appear fairly nightmarish, what? as seen with Halopus, who had slender, skinny oh, limbs, goodness. giving it an odd, unsettling appearance. Although, you wouldn't have to worry, because Halopus was a tiny creature that rarely grew taller than a boot, and mostly stuck to insects and other small prey. The other yeah. terrestrial crocs were quite small too, likely a result of living in the shadow of dinosaurs. And another group that ran into this size problem as well was our very own ancestors, the mammaliaforms. By now they'd been around for over 100 million years, and were well adapted for a mix of lifestyles with older fossils showing that some had developed the ability to glide, climb trees, and be semi-aquatic. Their diets were also quite versatile, with some specializing in plants, while others nibbled on meat or dabbled in both areas, as seen with the omnivorous Gimarododon, who may even have it's scavenged on dinosaurs. Yet, it was still like other mammalia forms, well, that's not, that's which not is to say, bad. small. <laughs> as on like average, one. these guys were no bigger than a shrew, making them hard to notice among so many titans. Nonetheless, there was a group that wasn't exactly giant, but were hard to miss. And these were the pterosaurs. The pterosaurs had established control of the skies roughly 80 million uh. years prior to this point and flew mostly unchallenged. Interestingly though, they weren't very populous as only a few remains from the time are known. Yet their bones were geologically widespread, indicating a successful conquest across yeah. a significant portion of Earth. Typically, fly, late Jurassic pterosaurs seem to have preferred marine and shoreline habitats where they could fill their stomachs with fish, insects, shellfish, and carrion. It's also been hypothesized that the largest pterosaurs could have actively hunted certain terrestrial creatures, with the biggest pterosaur being Lucignathus. This pterosaur lived in Europe and was a leviathan compared to coexisting relatives, with an estimated wingspan wow. of 3.6 meters or 12 feet, which along with sharp straight teeth, could have enabled it to hunt other pterosaurs that's, that's like considering that most were less than half its size. Yeah. And as king of yeah. flyers, the Lucignathus <laughs> didn't have much to worry about. Although it wasn't alone, as along with pterosaurs, bird-like dinosaurs had managed to take flight as well. In that day and age, they were still a novelty and Is very rare, with only one kind being known from that specific era, the Archaeopteryx. That is, this dinosaur go. is extremely monumental to paleontology, as it is the earliest known capable of powered flight. There are other contenders for this title too, who date back to 165 million years ago, but thus far, many paleontologists argue on the classification of these older animals. The Archaeopteryx would have used its flying abilities to hunt small prey, including reptiles and insects, and escape predators, as it was a tiny fellow who was similar in size to a modern day magpie. With so much life around you and above you, you probably won't be surprised to know that the waters were home to many as well. With the major difference being three minutes that while a lot of creatures okay. on land were wondrous, the oceans and seas were namely home to pure Oil. nightmares. Notably, Oil. the plesiosaurs. These were marine reptiles that, that were distinguished by monster, flat bodies, you know? <laughs> short tails, four flippers, and had a cosmopolitan distribution, meaning they could be found worldwide. They greatly varied in size, and many were apex predators, with the most terrifying of the bunch being the pliosaur family. While we commonly imagine plesiosaurs with long narrow necks, pliosaurs were the ones that had short necks and massive skulls, filled with sharp conical <laughs> teeth which allowed them to hunt down medium and large sized prey. You probably heard of the most famous one, the Lyperodon, yeah. yeah. but it had actually been dead for 5 million years at the time. What? Not to worry though, as the late Jurassic found an even bigger, more terrifying replacement, the pliosaurus. Adults oh. of this pliosaur were among the largest ever recorded, reaching up to 10 meters or 33 feet in length and weighed 5 tons. With their size, they easily killed whatever they could catch, including what we consider the jaws of the modern oceans, sharks. And now, this isn't to say that sharks were chumps back then. Yet, they were no pliosaur and didn't come close in size. But, they still would have been a problem for more toned down animals, including fish, and another famous staple of Mesozoic oceans, the ichthyosaurs. While ichthyosaurs had been the true giants for millions of years during the Triassic and early Jurassic, yeah. they had experienced a size decline in these days, mainly due to competition with the plesiosaurs. <laughs> However, this battle definitely wasn't one-sided, 
as shallow seas and open oceans still had plenty of different ichthyosaurus species that fill different niches and could be up to 7 meters or 23 feet long. Which is crazy to think about when considering that Triassic ichthyosaurs were sometimes almost four times bigger, making them absolutely horrifying to say the <laughs> Look least. Look at that thing. Don't panic though, as this time period had one more trick up its sleeve to give you nightmares, oh, yeah. and that is the Thalatosuchians, commonly nicknamed the marine crocodiles. In reality, <laughs> they weren't really true crocodiles, rather primitive distant relatives, though they did superficially resemble modern crocs with the biggest difference coming from their limbs and tails, which in certain members had evolved into flippers to provide locomotion. Like many other animals, these marine crocs Holy were found globally crap. and in some locations were apex predators. They had Holy compressed crap. and serrated teeth that allowed them to shear chunks of flesh off prey, which consisted of fish, ichthyosaurs, small plesiosaurs, and turtles. The two largest living members, Dacosaurus and Machimosaurus, may have hunted large animals too. And coincidentally, <laughs> Machimosaurus was actually the largest marine croc we know of, with adults being equal to the largest ichthyosaurs in length. And giving potential time travelers just one more reason to avoid Earth, one... Oh my god. All right. Oh, we'll, we'll leave it on... Uh, we'll leave it on this. Oh my god. Um. Yeah, wow. So, but I mean... I, I technically my my favorite is the Cretaceous, but there's there's so many like the Jurassic is just filled with a lot of craziness, and again, they, like they spread all over the world. Like they, they they were they conquered the world, and a lot of the same species did just you know a little uh, evolution around you know different different uh, spots of the world. Um, but like the sauropods, which are you know mostly are more so recognizable from the Jurassic rather than the Cretaceous um you know like those those are some of my favorites <laughs> yeah the, the stego the stego is so cool man like I, I if i had a chance like i would definitely take a stego as a pet i know that sounds crazy because you know those thagomyces are you know <laughs> deadly but you know you, you treat a stegosaurus right you know you hope you, you especially if you can raise one from a baby like oh yeah I, i'd be like hey I'm gonna teach that thing not to kill me it can kill other people don't kill me though <laughs> but like like stego Stego's like a, I was going to say top 10, but I, I might argue like top five favorite dinosaur. Like Stego is up there. Like it's, it's really cool. Um, obviously you got Allosaurus, which again, I didn't, I didn't know it was 75% of the predator population back uh, in the Jurassic. Um, that, that's insane to me. And the fact that you have so many if, different like kinds of, uh, predators back then, but the Allosaurus, which wasn't even the biggest. Again, the Saurophaganax was bigger than the Allosaurus, but the Allosaurus dominated more, which is just insane to think about. So there, there's just, like, yeah, I, I this is, I, I think what I'll do is I'll kind of do like a time period uh, video for everyone, and we'll kind of, uh, I'll do, maybe I should do like a tier list afterwards and be like, okay, is this really the worst place to time travel? But, um, yeah, I, I, there's, you know, you're not escaping a lot. And, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe the Triassic would be a little more, because again, that's when everything was rebounding and you had like, like a lot of like diversity and a lot of, um, kind of things kind of figuring in themselves out and their evolution out before, you know, the dinosaurs really took over. So Triassic would be really crazy. Um, Carboniferous, you have all the giant bugs. Like, imagine a bug like, I don't know, like <laughs> half your size or something. Like, uh, what is it? The is it megafauna? I think is what it is. Like the giant dragonflies. You have the um, uh, centipede, mill millipede, whatever. Uh, I am blanking. Whatever those the giant arthropod was called. You know, you have giant spiders, giant scorpions. You have, uh, like, ah, uh, I. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I hate bugs nowadays. Bugs nowadays, like the Black Widow, is like that big. I maybe maybe a little bigger. I I don't know. Like that that thing can kill you. Could kill. It can kill a grown man. It can kill an elephant. It can kill a giraffe. Like a, a Black Widow, something that big can kill. Now imagine something. <laughs> this big, you got fangs that are probably this long on those things. Like. No thanks. Like I, 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 I 
hate spiders now as it is. I don't want to go back to the Carboniferous. So I, I it's I, I'm gonna do a tier list at the end of the day. Uh, I'm gonna go. We're gonna go through a lot of different time periods, and uh, um, you got again. You got to kind of base it off of like earlier. A lot of stuff was in the, a lot of animals, and everything was in the water earlier on. So it's like okay, well then we kind of have to put ourselves like how, how would I don't like technically we can't live in the water technically, but like, how would we kind of, you know, what would it be like then for us? Like, is that really the worst of it? You know, you have all the mass extinctions, which I don't want to, I don't want to, that, that'll kind of be its own thing. Cause I don't want to like focus on like, Oh, like this is the worst time period to go because you had this, uh, you know, the asteroid or 95%, was it 95? I think it was 95% of uh, everything got, you know, vaporized and <laughs> died from the heat just before the try basically what caused the triassic to start and you know you got you got all these like er, um resets in the world um so I, I don't like that can be its own like tier list like video with all the um extinction level events and whatnot so we're gonna focus on like animals like we're, we're not gonna focus on the again the extinction level events so uh i think right now my my pick is probably the Carboniferous, just because like I, I would not want to be around with a bunch of like huge bugs. You have amphibians that are you know uh, stand probably like up to half the height of an average human, uh, and like a guy's average height is what like five nine or whatever. So you think like three feet, three and a half feet tall, something like that. Amphibians, like no thanks, <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> Again, you have the bugs that can stand that high. You have you know dragonflies that you know can get as big as a human uh I, well i guess like the length of a human i should say i, I don't know if, i don't know if they could pick us up maybe not an adult obviously they could pick up a kid probably but not not an adult i don't think a dragonfly could but um i think probably carboniferous is the worst let me know down below what you think the worst um time period to travel to is uh if you want to say something like a human history thing if you want to say again go back further in time like jurassic carboniferous or you know whatever um so but let me know what your uh what where you would not want to travel the most to what period in history don't go into the future because <laughs> we, we we right now we don't know what's going to happen in the future you have to go in the past we have to time travel backwards that's the only rule for this uh comment here is we can't just wait oh yeah in the year 3000 aliens invade enslave the world and kill 99 percent of the population or whatever like we, we we can't do that we're, we're we're from the year it's 2024 we're, we're not in the year 3000 so we, we don't know what's gonna happen you know a thousand years from now <laughs> but but yeah I, I i i might say carboniferous um you know you had like the oxygen could you know really uh was a lot higher so it's a lot easier to kind of spark fires and whatnot too so i that's my pick again we're gonna i'm gonna kind of do like a series and we're gonna go through like every uh time period i'm gonna have to try to find good videos on it um but this one i thought was really cool this one i enjoyed a lot so um for now i'm gonna go ahead and get on out of here like the video share the video around um subscribe to the channel that helps uh, liking the video really helps uh especially again because i'm not doing videos every single day so likes help a lot at least as far as i know you know when i was last doing active uh videos like likes really help so maybe things change i don't know they always change with youtube but um yeah we'll come back with more more of this more human history more more everything we're gonna do other stuff uh i'm gonna try to get a stream up i don't know if i'm gonna do a college game today or um if i'm going to do a uh, nfl game tomorrow we will see sometime this weekend we're gonna do something for now though i'm out of here